suitcase for me. And then I saw that ticket again. I the most wonderful parents in the world. It was still a whole year to graduation, and here was this terrific... There's the Eiffel Tower. Everything had been arranged, especially for me. The plane was even named for my home state, Minnesota. And then we were actually in the air. And in just a few hours, we'd be in Europe. Of our 47-day tour, we were going to have 45 days abroad. Right then, I must have been thinking about seeing all those famous buildings I'd been studying. There were already things to look at. A whole new world up there. There it was, almost before we knew it. It seemed hard to believe that we were really there. Yesterday, Minneapolis, today. I'll never forget how I felt when I first put my foot on foreign soil and tried my French on the customs man. It worked. And then we started out to see Paris. The first thing we did in every city was to take an orientation tour. Everybody started making snapshots to send home. Those guided tours helped us understand the general layout of the city so we could find the things we wanted to see more of by ourselves. And the tours always took in the high spots, like the... But as far as I was concerned, the high spot of Paris was the Louvre. Just as a building, this palace of the French kings is an amazing thing to see. The big attraction of the Louvre to most of our group was the fabulous art collection in the galleries. Our guide was a French art student. She spoke perfect English. Of course, Buddy wanted to see the Mona Lisa. After our tour left, I got a catalog and spent the rest of the day in the Louvre. But to a girl, Paris means just one thing, shopping. We all bought perfume. It cost less than a third its price at home. Late that afternoon, we had a citron passé at the Café de la Paix. It had been quite a day, and it wasn't over yet. The bright lights were part of our tour, too. We saw shows in four different places and wound up at midnight at the Moulin Rouge. no formal plans for the group. Four of us went to have another look at Notre Dame. I think we had the idea we were visiting sort of a historical monument. I soon caught on to the fact that it wasn't just a museum. It was a living church. I'll never forget the rose window of Notre Dame. I spent my first free morning in Paris poking around the bookstalls along the Seine. It was just the way I'd always imagined it, a warm, peaceful summer day. Suddenly I thought, now what am I doing here looking at magazines about architecture when Notre Dame is right across the river?
I'd studied French in school, but this guy spoke it so well I couldn't understand it. And then Emily came to the rescue, sort of. It was obvious that Mike was having language trouble, but I knew that like most of us, he'd equipped himself with a pocket dictionary, so I made him produce it. If I'd only known when I was studying French that someday I'd have to use it. She just left me there to swim or sink in French. But I found that if you really try, it isn't too hard after all. My new friend was an architect himself. The reason he wanted to talk to me was that he had liked my angle of Notre Dame and he had made a sketch from the very same viewpoint. You know, they can't put it in the travel folders, but my best memories of the trip are about people I met, not just things I saw. Pretty soon, my French was actually beginning to work. Robert explained some of his other sketches. A detail of the Louvre and the gate tower of Villeneuve. Next day, we drove right through that same gate in Villeneuve. We were on our way to the Riviera in our chartered coach. Hotel in Cannes was right on the Mediterranean and had its own private beach. We spent most of our days in Cannes around the water. The boys had a habit of monopolizing the ball until one of the girls found a way to get even. We were working on our suntans when I saw somebody water skiing. That's my favorite sport back in Minnesota. Fred dared me and that's all I needed. lunch. French cooking. Meals on the terrace of the Martinez were something to remember. After our two wonderful days in Cannes, we were off again. Monte Carlo was our last stop on the French Riviera, and then we were in Italy, driving along the Italian Riviera through towns with romantic names like Sestra Levante and Santa Margherita and Rapallo. The afternoon we arrived in Rome was pretty warm. Right after we checked into our hotel, some of us decided to go out for Cokes. Something seemed to be wrong. Everybody was looking at us. We found out in a hurry that you may wear bikinis on the Riviera, but you don't wear shorts in a European city like Rome. During our first two days in Rome, our whole group did the town together. Then, as usual, we had time to go out on our own. There was no special rush on, so four of us decided to take a carrot sailor around town. I can't think of any better way to do sightseeing than from one of these one horsepower fresh air taxi cabs. We crossed the Tiber to Hadrian's tomb and then went on to Vatican City. You don't have to be an architect to appreciate the sweep of the great piazza in front of St. Peter's Cathedral. We had another look at the ruins of the Forum. Emily and I had quite an argument about the Victor Emmanuel Monument. 
But I still like it. It was late in the afternoon by the time we got to the Coliseum. We'd planned it that way. I'd read somewhere that one of the most memorable sights in the world is the Coliseum by the light of the full moon. Next morning, we left for Florence on another private coach. First thing in Florence was our usual orientation tour. From Piazza Michelangelo, we looked down on the city. We picked out the palaces and the cathedral. You know that dome was held together with a wooden chain? Down in the city, we had a closer look at the cathedral. Yodo designed this tower. The most striking sight of our tour around the cathedral was the baptistry door that Michelangelo called the Gates of Paradise. Just a few years ago, someone found out that the old legends were true, and the gates really were gold. Florence has always been a great art city. The museums are loaded. The Birth of Venus by Botticelli is in the Uffizi Palace. I went back to the Uffizi the day after we had taken our tour to have more time to study the Botticellis and the other masterpieces like Leonardo da Vinci's Annunciation to the Virgin. The Uffizi Gallery used to be the offices of the Medici princes. There's still a secret passage across the Ponte Vecchio to their palace on the other side of the river. The sides of the Ponte Vecchio are lined with fascinating little shops. Florence is the ideal place to go shopping. I bought all my Christmas presents there. Just look at the beautiful leather things. Of course, Florentine leather is famous, and it's not expensive in Italy. Sometimes we could look in the shop windows and watch people making the things they sold. We learned that a cameo is carved from one piece of shell with two differently colored layers. The straw market in Florence was our own special discovery. Bargaining is a national sport in Italy, so one of the girls who had studied Italian did our dickering for us. But even if you're not an expert bargainer, beautiful handmade straw bags cost practically nothing here. The old covered market is a good place to look for lots of things you expect to find in Italy. I'd always wanted an Italian silk scarf, but there were so many lovely ones, I had a hard time making up my mind. I finally wound up with some extra ones for Christmas presents. Oh, we had a wonderful time in Florence. By the middle of the afternoon, our new straw bags were full of exciting little packages. And then we found the silver shops. They had all kinds of interesting small things that didn't strain the budget, like silver lipstick cases. Each one has its own built-in mirror. There are no two alike because they're all handmade. This was the sort of thing the boys seemed to pick up for presents to take home. And then there were Florentine bangles for charm bracelets. They make the things right there in the back of the shop. In these same shops, they've been doing work like this since the time of the Renaissance. 
Well, finally I decided on a lipstick case. Italian lira was still a little confusing to me, so I paid too much. I got back what I'd overpaid, just as in any good shop at home. One of my nicer memories of Florence. Not all the art in Florence is in museums. By this time, I was getting used to having an audience. The curiosity was always friendly, and I began to feel it was kind of fun to have people interested in what I was doing. Early next morning, we left Florence on our special coach and started north to Venice. By this time, we all knew each other pretty well. <laughs> Joe had a new hat again that day. Joe was our crowd's comedian. I guess every tour has one. There's absolutely nothing on earth like Venice. It's built on islands with canals for streets. So of course, here we had a new kind of orientation tour. Our guide knew everything about Venice and he certainly taught a lively history lesson. First stop was at the Palace of the Doges. The Doges ruled Venice at the same time that the Medici family ran Florence. The Venetian palaces show that the rulers' lives were safer here than in Florence where palaces looked more like forts Our tour broke up around noon in the square in front of St. Mark's Cathedral. The architects who built Old Venice must have been happy men with the backing of wealth and the craftsmen to turn out things like this. By this time, I'd found out that Mike always had a guidebook when I wanted one. And besides, he knew so much about the things we were seeing. On our way to lunch, we stopped to feed the famous pigeons of St. Mark's. Of course, the romantic way to see Venice is by gondola. Maybe it was because I just happened to be around that Mike asked me to come with him that afternoon. But he didn't have any trouble at all talking me into it. afternoon was sheer enchantment. It seemed that we had the nicest gondola, and our gondolier had the reddest sash, and the day was the most beautiful that anyone could ever have in Venice. Mario made sure we didn't miss the Cadoro, the finest of the palaces along the Grand Canal. And then, toward the end of a leisurely and very pleasant afternoon, we came to the Rialto Bridge. It was like drifting through a dream. From Venice, it's only a short jump to Switzerland. We stopped that night at Zermatt in the high Swiss Alps. They met us at the station with a genuine stagecoach. It rides like a tumbrel, but what it lacks in comfort, it certainly makes up in charm. Anyway, it's only a few hundred feet to the hotel. Early in the morning, we took the cogwheel railway up to the Gornergrat. The Alpen village of Zermatt fell away below. Then around a the corner, we got our first view of the Matterhorn with its veil of morning mist. 
the rack and pinion railway wound us higher and higher through some of the world's most spectacular scenery. We were above snow line, only a half an hour out of Zermatt. From the end of the railway, it's only a few minutes walk to the peak of the Gornergrat. At Zermatt, the tour separated. I took a trip up through Grimsel Pass on my way to Zurich. During the next three weeks, some of us wanted to travel independently to see the things that specially interested each of us. Zurich is probably the best place in Europe to study contemporary architecture. Before I left home, arrangements had been made for an introduction to one of the professors at the famous Technicum, the great technical university of Zurich. I spent several days there. From Zermatt, I went to Geneva to attend the International Institute of Education, sponsored by the State University of New York. Director of the Institute is Dr. Emerson Newthart of Buffalo Teachers College. It was such a pleasant campus. Our speakers were distinguished authorities in their fields. Dr. John Forbay was on a round-the-world lecture tour. He talked about the global concept of international aviation. He made us realize how our world is getting smaller. His whole trip around the world would take less than four days flying time. My French began to get really good at Geneva. The practice I'd had on our tour had helped. And here our lessons took on real meaning because we used our French every day. Suddenly it seemed to come very easily. One of the speakers on our course was Dr. Borsinger, director of the International Red Cross. He explained the operation of this famous agency. Many of our speakers were from the great international organizations with headquarters in Geneva. And each afternoon, we made a field trip to a place like the Palais Wilson of the United Nations. One of the high spots of my whole trip was the opportunity the Institute gave me to meet Dr. Ralph Bunch. Since Dr. Bunch has helped shape so many recent historic events, and I plan to be a social studies teacher, this was a wonderful experience for me. The Institute also arranged a visit to the famous Pestalozzi Children's Village. Each child in this international school lives in a chalet with other children from his own country. Then all the national groups get together for activities like this clay modeling class I visited. Most of the children are war orphans. This boy is from Greece. The children speak German together because German is spoken in this part of Switzerland. But in their national houses, they stick to their native languages and study the same courses they would at home. What I saw at the Pestalozzi school was pretty hopeful. Children from countries that had recently been at war, yet they were learning to get along together in peace. Every weekend while we were at Geneva, we took an overnight excursion. One of them started with a cruise up Lake Geneva. Our tour director was a remarkable person. Those terraces on the hillsides are vineyards. We passed the lovely Isle of Salignon. 
and then the Castle Byron wrote about in The Prisoner of Chillon. Our course at Geneva was certainly fun, as well as a unique educational opportunity. After the time we had for individual travel or summer school study, our tour came together again at Zurich Airport. This was to be our longest hop in Europe, so to save time, we took to the air again. By noon, we were in London, 500 miles away. The first thing I unpacked was my sketch pad, and I walked over to the Houses of Parliament. We went to Piccadilly Circus and took a double-deck bus and rode all over town. We crossed Tower Bridge and saw the Tower of London. History came to life for us when we talked with the beef eater. The guards of Elizabeth I wore the same kind of uniform 400 years ago. Of course, we planned to be at Buckingham Palace to see the changing of the guard, some of the stirring pageantry we saw so often on our tour. into the lovely English countryside to Warwickshire. We were going to Stratford-on-Avon. Our first stop was Shakespeare's birthplace. Stratford looked just the way I'd always thought it would. Mulligan windows and half-timbered buildings. Shakespeare learned English in this grammar school. Here we met Mrs. Mary Ann Brown. She had been in charge of one of the historic buildings in Stratford. And now that she was retired, she still liked to talk with visitors. This was another of those delightful that made every day of our trip so memorable. Mrs. Brown told us how to find the path that Shakespeare took when he went to Shottery to court Anne Hathaway. We picked up our tickets at the Shakespeare Memorial Theater and walked along the romantic Avon. That evening, we saw Romeo and Juliet. Next morning, we left England on the Channel Ferry. The white cliffs of Dover dwindled away in the distance as we headed toward France. We had dinner in the Eiffel Tower restaurant on our last evening abroad. Our tour had wound up with two more wonderful days in Paris. Naturally, we were talking about what the trip had meant to each of us. This certificate I'd earned at the Institute in Geneva was something tangible. But just as important, I found new understanding and new interests. They'll make me a better teacher and, I think, a more interesting person. Mike had really come out of his shell. You know, I took this step to see things. Well, I saw the famous buildings, and I learned a great from them but I also learned a lot about meeting people and having fun with them. Now I realize how much this means to my work. After all, an architect builds houses for people. I'm sure that we all got much more than we expected from our air adventure to Europe.